The Wizard of Oz is a light-hearted, affectionate, beautifully realised adaptation of a children's book that changed how we tell stories on film. Return to Oz is not. This was a stone-cold nightmare, telling kids that if they're somewhere over that rainbow, it's probably run by demons and on fire. A major bomb at the box office, partly because of the response, it was destined to be a cult classic, in the wrong place at the wrong time, while including all the ingredients that would get a generation to talk about this as a weird, edgy take on their parents' favourite. Truer to the source material it came from, and all about scaring kids, because everything from your childhood is secretly twisted and dark and <laughs> Well, uh, that's how I'd remembered it too. Not so long ago, we were picking out films for a movie night, and I suggested we do an Oz theme, including Return, which I'd been shown once when I was around eight at school. It's a bit weird looking back on it now. What teacher would do this? This guy? In spite of the gulf of 20 plus years, the film was almost exactly as I remembered. Every frame burned into my mind thanks to an incredibly intense take on the subject. But I, I have to tell you, there were other things I felt this time that were not what I expected. I didn't think I'd be the one to say it, but this might be the most uplifting experience I've had revisiting a nostalgic classic. Not only less frightening than I'd remembered, for the most part, but actually better made than I'd realised, and frankly, totally life affirmed. To the point where its online reputation, so blatantly missing what the film's purpose is, kind of annoys me. So, you know, what else is new? Perhaps we've let ourselves get carried away. After being conditioned by so many to remember this as depicting the true horror of Oz or whatever, this struck me as an incredibly sincere celebration of everything Oz. The original film, the books, and most importantly, the industrious, optimistic spirit I think that world embodies as one of the great modern fantasies. Sure, there's truth to some of the reactions and critical takes, but you know, for such a scary, offbeat experience, and maybe because of all that, I'm gonna suggest that Return to Oz is, and I really mean this, shockingly nice. L. Frank Baum's Wizard of Oz was an attempt to create a new fantasy for children, spawning a series of 13 books and a handful of short stories, all expanding on the wonderful world of Oz. It's very much a fantasy through a turn-of-the-century lens. For every witch and wizard is a scarecrow, tin man, living china doll, or clown man with extending neck, even a couple of fish people. Things that could only be conceived of this way in that era, making for a unique view of reality, and it became incredibly popular. Baum was the engineer of that expansion, going as far as to pen several plays that he wanted to transform into huge musical extravaganzas with plans for so much else to follow. Instead, the Oz brand ended up getting very diluted, and Baum continued to ride the success of the books until his death. Years later, Walt Disney made waves with Hollywood's first major animated feature, Snow White, which both shook the industry by showing what was possible with animation and that a children's fantasy film could kill at the box office, encouraging those interested to try again. With that, we get MGM's 1939 musical spectacular The Wizard of Oz, a groundbreaking piece of work performed by great actors and with technologies that for the time were downright stunning. It's really one of the industry's first major modern blockbusters. Even now, you could argue that many huge films still owe a lot to the specifics of Oz and how it's structured. It had to change some of the book to get there, altering many of the finer details and excising the entire third act, but was still more faithful than a few previous efforts, and was not a million miles away from what Baum was doing every time he revised his own work as plays. Trust me, if he could have seen Bert Lahr as the lion, he'd have written him that way for sure. It used the language of cinema to better emphasise the story as a child's imagination brought to life, in a way the books couldn't. Almost implied the dreamy sepia Kansas is more of a daydream than the bright, vivid Oz, with a song that took America by storm yearning for something more real somewhere else. It's just a great experience from beginning to end. Audacious, emotive, and very funny. A lot of bumbling. And if you don't like it, then uh, get bent, I guess. That said, it wasn't the runaway success they'd initially hoped. While doing well with audiences and critics, the film outpaced its ambitions, too expensive to recoup the majority of its costs in the original run, and only just about managing that when it was released into cinemas a decade later. But upon being broadcast on television in 1956, a new audience discovered the film and its popularity went through the roof which renewed interest in the world of Oz and put the film at the forefront of pop culture forever after. Even now, mention Oz and chances are you think of the film first, inspiring multiple variations over the years and filtering into the collective consciousness. 
However, it's because it took so long to find its audience that there was never talk of a direct sequel, and not much use made of the later books. It had calcified into this cultural touchstone that couldn't be rivaled or messed with, and any further Oz projects that emerged were often low budget and directly drawing on the film's impression, often making a worse one by comparison. No one was bringing their own stamp. Now, Disney had actually purchased the rights to the later Oz books in 54. Walt felt he could make something of those stories with his own musical spin-offs, and tried to kickstart this through his Disneyland show with the Mouseketeers. But it became apparent they weren't the right fit for the material, and the whole project fell by the wayside. And Annette said, I, I don't see him smiling. I think at that point he was probably thinking, no, I don't think it's gonna work. So the rights languished until a chance meeting with Walter Murch, a respected editor and sound mixer who'd worked closely with Coppola and Lucas on some of their biggest hits. George's success in particular was the kind of thing a recently struggling Disney had wanted to achieve for years, and Murch, who was finally being approached to direct his own feature, was asked if there was anything he had in mind that might be worth exploring. And they asked that question, I said, a sequel to The Wizard of Oz. And the executive straightened up behind his desk and started pushing papers around a little nervously. And he said, oh, well, did you know that we own the rights to all those books? Why don't you go and write a treatment of what you would do and give it to us? With those submitted and the promises made, production began, and soon the stage was set to finally return to Oz. Boom. Cut to title. Continue speaking so as to avoid copyright issues. Ah, oh, no way. I put that in the brackets, didn't I? Somewhere in Kansas, after recovering from her experience with a tornado, young Dorothy can't seem to stop talking about a land called Oz, and worse, how much she wants to go back. Her aunt and uncle find it all very upsetting, and decide she needs medical help, taking her to see a doctor who's been working on a revolutionary new technology. You might have heard of it. Very uncontroversial. She quickly works out this isn't okay, and, along with another girl, manages to escape. But things get hairy and she finds herself, shock, back in Oz. Which sadly isn't as she remembers. While she was away, a terrible creature called the Gnome King and his minions took the city's emeralds and turned all its citizens into statues and trinkets. So, with the help of a number of new friends, it's up to Dorothy to go on another journey to rescue Oz and restore the world she remembers. Not that this is an Oz you'll recognise either, or even a Dorothy, playing much closer to the book's original descriptions. We leave not a sepia-tinged Kansas, but a grey, bleak landscape, leaving Toto behind for a chicken who, while in Oz, can talk. How's my grammar? Munchkin land is overgrown, and the yellow brick road has been shredded. Rocks peer out of the ground to witness the new intruder. It's like the world's been processed through a surreal 90s adventure game, and we're met with this incredibly stark image. D who? <laughs> Come here. Oh, yeah, yeah. Any comfort you'd get from seeing anyone you recognise is cut very short. Instead, Dorothy coming across even weirder pals like TikTok, the wind-up one-man army of Oz, Jack Pumpkinhead, kinda self-explanatory, the Gump, heh <laughs> Gump, all from the later books, all a little more tangible and real, maybe too real, and that's part of the objective of this new journey. The MGM film was very vaudeville. It was a spiritual successor to the work Baum had done, realising the books as plays, so it has a theatrical, stagey quality. Every set a tableau, shot from one side, and the characters people in obvious makeup and costumes, Judy Garland playing much younger than her real age, or suggesting the look of a lion or scarecrow or tin man, and letting our suspension of disbelief do the rest. Nothing wrong with that, it's part of its charm. But with special effects having moved so far on, Merch wanted to bring Oz to life more literally, hoping to directly adapt the illustrations of early versions of the books by William Denslow and John R. Neal, and inspired by what he was seeing happen in television and film. I had the experience as my son was growing up of watching with him watching the American television program Sesame Street. Something about the Muppet approach to technology and they had gotten over the years very sophisticated in their use of uh, puppets. That sensibility made me think that maybe that could be linked to doing a sequel to The Wizard of Oz. Production-wise, there's a bit of everything going on. Puppets, elaborate costumes, stop motion, animal husbandry. I think one of the big reasons people love practical effects outside of their physical fidelity is because they love the narrative of problem solving. CGI certainly has a lot of similar stories to tell, where it took human ingenuity to figure out how to best convey an idea. But there's a valiant simplicity to someone going out to their garden shed and figuring out how 
all these thoughts are going to practically exist on film, something that can be solved purely through physical skill, and this film is like the poster child for that. Because all the denizens of Oz in the books are so strikingly different from one another, there's not any single technique they can pull out to tackle every character, but that works fine, because it means they have their own personality that comes out of the unique ways they're built to move, and with few major stars taking up the already steep budget, the puppeteers could provide it all. Brian Henson himself took on the role of Jack, providing the voice and performance of easily one of the most unwieldy puppets I think exists on film. But that adds to his nervousness, his precarious, thrown-together quality, like he shouldn't really be, not unnoticed by movement coach Pons Ma. He, was, he would be stiff like this, he would hold himself upright like that. Whereas the puppet didn't, didn't have all this to hold himself up, and it was more like this. We, I had to take Stuart and get him out of being really rigid to being able to be loose and give a little pop to his, to his knee. Do you understand all that, TikTok? I understand it better than you do. TikTok has a full person inside of him, but not anyone short, no, no. There's a full-on athlete in there, hunched over with his legs between his knees, staring at a monitor up his ass, moving about by listening to the sounds on set. Oh, pain. If the scene went longer than two and a half minutes, we had to stop and break the scene into bits so that Michael and TikTok could uh, complete the scene without dying of suffocation or heat stroke. This gang of rowdy boys, known as the Wheelers, had to come up with an entirely new way to move as one of Baum's stranger creations, looking like Starlight Express was still stinking up theatres. They are not as faithful to the books in how 80s they appear, same for all the villains, but I feel that's by design. With such traditional takes on the heroes, the villains come off as a little more garish, which ties into what I feel the film is doing, and in the Wheelers' case, is really all they have to their advantage. That was the great thing about the Wheelers. They were all show, and they couldn't really back anything up. They could just, right, right, right. they just had to be really big and scary. All bark and no bite, because what exactly. can they do? They can't, yeah. no, they can't grab you. Yeah, what can they even do? Return to Oz is a practical effects treasure trove with countless stories from some eccentric individuals who love the craft, applying textures I think fit Oz perfectly. The Oz of the books was designed for children, with both films suggested to be created from a child's point of view, and both were realized in these practical ways that best suited the texture of each. Wizard of Oz is like, say it with me now, a theme park. Mascot character costumes in these clean, user-friendly facades. And Return is like a child trying to recreate Oz in their bedroom. Everything's made of practical, toy-like materials, and the sets all look like abandoned parks and gardens. The more elaborate sets range from incredibly ornate and self-reflective to ruggedly foreboding and insular, to reflect the adults who own them. And while there's not a huge amount of locations, they're all very distinct and make you feel like you've travelled through quite a large chunk of the land. Speaking personally, that always came through as an exciting journey to take and hearing about how it all came to be isn't any less so. Honestly, all the stories around it are kinda nutty. How they shot Kansas in England and discovered the Salisbury field they chose was full of unexploded bombs. An entire complicated sequence had to be totally reshot because this dress didn't look right on camera. And when I say complicated, I mean complicated. Alongside a puppet, young actor Feruza Bolk had 30 live chickens of different skills to work with, and was either freezing cold in Kansas or so overwhelmed by the heat on set that she fainted. And I'm waving and I'm happy and all of a sudden I just kind of went, and eh. <laughs> just fell off him. And then we came running up, you know, oh, wake up, wake up. Tensions were frequent in the early days, as everyone tried to suss out Walter's work ethic, with people quitting as his inexperience became more apparent. Walter's sitting in his chair, and quite frankly, he, he was obviously confused. And I said, Walter, what's wrong? And he says, I don't know where I am. And I said, what do you mean? He says, no, I don't know where we are in the picture. I don't know. I said, come on upstairs and lie down. I said, oh shit, here we go. Five weeks into it, and then we're like this. It didn't help that this was during Disney's most tumultuous shakeup. The regime that originally greenlit the project had been replaced by Michael Eisner's team, who were trying to overhaul the business to appeal to a modern audience. Enough money had been spent on the project to create so many assets that there was no danger of shutting down, but there wasn't a great desire to see it through. Which is why, on the producer's advice, brought in from the Police Academy films, for all that tells you, they decided to remove merch. Until George stepped in. The phone calls from Lucas. He said, I hear Walter's not well. I said, you know, it's very strange. I don't know you, George, but I got to tell you something. I don't know whether he's capable of going on uh, to complete the pictures. He's rather confused. And George says, I'll be over there. It'll be 24 hours. 20 minutes later, I get another call. Who 
was the same as Spielberg. 20 minutes later, I get the third phone call. And it's from Francis Coppola. I want to complete the picture. It's funny because comparatively the original Wizard of Oz was also an absolute nightmare to shoot, partly because of the harsher truths of early Hollywood. The blind leading the blind through a production that would have to invent multiple solutions to one of the first major special effects films, without poisoning any of the actors, if possible. Return was a smaller affair on all accounts, and while many were frustrated with the initial process, it was a fairly peaceful shoot with a lot of happy actors, merch finishing the film just fine. What was really causing so much stress was simply the tone. The dailies that came in were from the scenes in Kansas and the Asylum, which were absolutely grim. A feeling of dread they felt would carry over into the rest of the picture, and if Disney found it bleak, then the critics found it absolutely funereal. Wait, let's be fair, and judge Return to Oz strictly on its merits. It's a bummer. You didn't like it at all? Not much, no. You, uh, it, 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 it has its moments, but if you blink too often, I think you miss them. But there's no magic here, no glow, nothing remotely matching the genius of the original. It ought to be fun, it ought to be upbeat, it ought to be sweet, yeah. it ought to be wondering. Yeah. It shouldn't be scary. Okay. None of them took against the way it was made. If there was anything they seemed to be in agreement on, it was that the effects were incredibly impressive. Yeah. The Gnome King, which you like, yeah. it was done by Will Vinton, who won an Academy Award using that process yeah. in a short study, it's well done. The wheelers were cr terrific. The, the guys who go really along nice. on the wheels, on the, they, they were, were very creepy, and they felt like the stuff in the original books. But clearly it was the immediate encroachment on the feel of the original and the seemingly depressing qualities that had them writing it off. It's not that I don't get it, because I can see how a small child or uninvested adult wouldn't take to the film. It wasn't an uptime for a lot of family pictures. Disney's slump was felt across the industry, and the last thing I think anyone wanted was to feel that something as uplifting lifting as the original Oz film was now being overwritten. With much time and distance on that situation though, I think it's easier now to look at it not only as a much less contentious project, but also a much less depressing one. There are frightening elements, and yeah, a lot of them are pretty much as written in the source. The gnomes, they're from the books. The wheelers, they're from the books. The princess with the many interchangeable heads. <laughs> as much as I'm arguing for the film's actual intent, I can't downplay the effect this had on me and everyone else who saw it as a kid, or even now is going to watch this and find themselves met with at least one £10 bag of nope. Oh. But speaking as someone who saw it so young, and who it's definitely lived with, it's never ruined my sleep. Maybe yours is fine. There's some disturbing suggestions and moments, but no real violence or gore. Nothing that has me looking away or feeling scared, as much as it's made me feel kind of, well, sad. And I don't even feel now that the film's aim is to horrify. Merch himself doesn't view the film as horrific, understanding why it would be taken that way, but not the intent he went in with. I wanted it to engage the audience fully, and I wanted Dorothy to be in desperate situation. Um, but I, the anguish of many of the reviews and some of the comments that I got from the film were, was surprising. And death of the author or not, I think that's a significant part of understanding its purpose. As frightening as people may have found it, and as much as they believe that inherently comes from the source, I don't think Merch set out to challenge the original film and set people thinking of Oz as a nightmare universe, certainly not the universe Baum created. Yes, the books can also be pretty frightening out of context. Horrific things happened alongside some weird imagery, like how the Tin Man was originally a normal man who cut himself to pieces after being cursed by a witch to replace them with tin and someone stitched those pieces back together. But I wouldn't mistake the flippant whimsy and black humour of early children's literature for horror. In a world where the mortality rate was up, humour and magic in children's stories were often derived from morbid imagery, and that's absolutely the overriding tone of the books, with the morbid material always written in a very tongue-in-cheek manner. And then the wizard cuts the vegetable man in half, but it's okay because they planted him so he can grow into several new men. E gads! Baum's humour was bluntly ironic. The characters often talking openly and articulately about their personal flaws, but hilariously unable to recognise how to fix them, always assuming they're stupider than they actually are, which, naturally, makes them behave even more like idiots. My favourite example is King Scarecrow talking to Jack Pumpkinhead. He assumes that Jack is a different species, and therefore will need to be translated, with his royal translator deliberately misinterpreting them both to each other to teach them a lesson. It's a lot of wordplay, and it's fairly cheeky, but it makes for a very endearing world of sincere characters. 
If there is an edge, and there is, it comes more with the territory of a fantasy derived within rural America, a very practical clunker-junker view of life from a farm. It's why Scotty Young was a good choice to illustrate the Marvel Oz comics, with Eric Shanhauer adapting Baum's original books word for word, alongside supplementary materials. Young's illustrations are scratchy and off-kilter, often likened to Tim Burton style, but without the reserved qualities. Less stark and expressionist. They're much more traditionally cartoonish and playful. I think that's Oz. Rough around the edges, but with a sense of fun that winks at the audience and prevents it from getting too heavy. I'd say that's definitely true of the original film, remembered for some sugar-sweet moments, but really not afraid to have that edge. The people who make fun of it not realising they're in on the joke, that it's a satire of its own. Just check Tolkien's trees against these pugnacious ones. Oh, no. <laughs> You can obviously find a lot of darkness in return, but people have been trying to spin the original as a secretly dark film for years. So many folks desperate to prove this crane was a munchkin hanging themselves, like they're Colin Farrell. There's definitely things the film brings to the party that actually outdo the book when it comes to being spooky. The one-eyed little old lady of the book's first couple illustrations has nothing on the Technicolor nightmare they got out of Margaret Hamilton's witch, who's still paying for years of boomer therapy. No matter how you choose to adapt it, I think Oz comes with both qualities in each hand. That belies the original being this sweet little film, and equally belies Return being a joyless nightmare. It's also very funny. Can you talk if you haven't got a brain? I don't know. But some people without brains do an awful lot of talking. Oh, yeah, if his brains ran down, how could he talk? It happens to people all the time, Jack. I mean, these characters are so endearing. TikTok is a little legend, the true OZ MVP. He believes in Dorothy completely, has an answer for everything, considers himself the entire army of Oz, and he can live up to that. <laughs> Come here, you. With his wind up brains in action, he can do anything, but that's, you know, a pretty silly design flaw. Action has run down. <laughs> Maybe you were scared whenever one of the gnomes appeared to report in on their master in these PS1 loading screens, but the dialogue let us know they weren't quite as tough as they liked to make out. She has it. Chicken with her. Chicken. Like, guys, one of the main characters is a flying couch. Someone's laughing. Merch adapts not only the look, but the style of writing, faithfully enough that it can't help but retain the same sense of humour. And what keeps its charm is that Dorothy takes it all seriously, and invests in the reality of them as much as her life in Kansas. Maybe more. And the feeling's mutual. The Ozites treat Dorothy as the most senior authority in the room, so even when she has great doubts, it gives her the confidence to be the person they think she is, making for a very positive character to the point of being comically adorable. This might not have been the case if it weren't for Feruza Balk's performance, giving Dorothy a similar intensity to Judy, but much more internal. Judy's strength on screen was always, rather tragically, her vulnerability. She could just turn it on at the drop of a hat and change the feel of whatever she channeled it through. Ridiculous amount of emotional power inside of that tiny lady. But Feruza's intensity was all in her look. You never know exactly what she's thinking, but you realise she's giving it serious thought, trusting in the curious world around her, and bursting with energy when she does react to prove how seriously she's taken it. Aww. The fact this intense younger Dorothy so sincerely believes in Oz heightens the level of threat, but also our believability in the toy-like world around her that an older child wouldn't manage, making her look greater in her abilities to overcome it. I don't find it a matter of the film being either scary or wholesome, but an in-between. That feeling is inherent to the Oz Baum created, and the Oz you bring to the page or screen every time you make use of those characters, whether intended or not, no matter how far you go in either direction. You know, if the original is darker than it's often given credit, then Return is totally lighter than folks want to admit. The horrific things that happen heightened by the nature of Oz, a perhaps surreal but always comedic fantasy. Tie my feet together. As Baum wrote, Oz was written solely to please the children of today. It aspires to being a modernised fairy tale, in which the wonderment and joy are attained, and the heartache and nightmares are left out. But while all of that feels true, it's not only the tone or the production that makes me feel so good about what Return is, or why I realise it's stuck with me over so many years. As a child, you assume everything you see is going to make sense when you're older, and sometimes that doesn't happen. I've been back to a lot of nostalgic things I liked, and it's either been exactly the same, or you've realised, oh, this isn't doing anything that works. Return, on the other hand, was like I suddenly was able to read hieroglyphs or something. The meaning it was trying to get across began to make sense in a way it never had before, without betraying 
everything I'd felt at the time, and now I see it as part of a truly optimistic message, one that, if you have any awareness of the books, is pretty big. So, I think it's worth noting specifically at this point that Return is an adaptation of the two direct sequels to the original book, Marvelous Land of Oz and Ozma of Oz. By and large, the plot and structure of the story is almost beat for beat what happens in Ozma of Oz, where Dorothy and a chicken are caught in a storm and washed up on the shoreline of Oz's neighbouring country, Ev. Oz. Ev. Most scenes, characters, and even some dialogue is lifted almost directly from that particular story. Not at all beautiful, you understand, but you have a certain prettiness. I believe I'll lock you in the tower for a few years till your head is ready, and then I'll take it. I believe you will not! It's mostly a faithful retelling. However, there's also a smattering of material from Marvelous Land, a story not about Dorothy, but a new character, a boy named Tip, which is one of the reasons Merch chose to skip that plotline. This is the book where we first meet Ozma, Jack Pumpkinhead, and the Gump, as well as Bringo Jagnini and the Flibby Owl. No, no, I made those up, I'm sorry. Knowing both books gives us a better idea of a couple of things here, most notably how certain characters and plot elements are combined in order to give us a more streamlined narrative, much like the original film. I think also in part to get as much Oz content from the books into a major film, so a wider audience can know what else is out there. The woman with the many interchangeable heads in the book is Princess Languidere, but in the film she takes the name of the Wicked Witch of the North, Mombi. <laughs> Mombi. Sorry, I love these names. A major character in Marvelous Land. That character imprisoned Princess Ozma and brought Jack to life. So giving those plot details to Languidere bridges them into Triple O's existing plot nicely. Yet it's also knowing what's not in the books that I think better illuminates many of the film's intentions, as both a love letter to the series and what it's trying to say thematically. There's been many wild theories sewn across the internet about what it all means, the trouble being that most of it is attributed to Baum's work and personal life. That's definitely going to be in the mix. It's his work being adapted. But while faithful, the film's just as particular in how it changes the source as the original movie, and it's what Merch specifically brings to the table where you'd be better off in finding the film's overall message, as well as realising it in no way attempts to reject any version of Oz over another. For a start, while it stands alone, there's a bunch that absolutely plays on knowledge and appreciation of the original film in order to get the reactions it wants. There are no flashbacks or attempts to show the audience what Oz was like before it begins. The audience is almost expected to come in with some idea of the Oz Dorothy remembers, and it's doubtless they'll mostly be thinking at the time of release of that original feature, especially with parents showing it to their children, before the regret. <laughs> It's not in the book that she returns directly to Munchkinland to see a torn up yellow brick road, turning the adapted scene with the wheelers almost into an inverted version of that opening and what she expects to happen. In that sense, it's brilliant because we're put in the same position as her. We want to see a particular version of Oz play out that we aren't met with, and that's so much more upsetting. Talk about trust issues. It's not the only inversion either. Many of the elements taken from the books are placed in the story almost as if to mirror the original film. Toto, not in the two sequels, is shown and then directly replaced with Bellina. TikTok's sort of a tin man, Jack's a bit of a scarecrow. Even the gump kind of tenuously acts as a lion, a once great creature now reduced to something silly that he has to make work. While we see some of those characters later on, there's definitely a feeling at the start they've been replaced. You go in wanting to see them, then wanting to see them rescued, then realising you actually quite like these new guys. And while that works to forge connections with the audience through that kind of familiarity, I think it also largely plays on the idea that Oz is always what Dorothy brings to it. I mean, the greatest connection between the two films is the conceit that Oz could all be in Dorothy's head, and unlike either of the two books, Return creates an entire premise about Dorothy's belief in Oz, and how a little girl who believed such things in that period and location might have been treated. The electroshock therapy stuff, this is all merch territory, and that experience in the asylum becomes the basis for how the events of those books are interpreted. Much like the original film, we have actors doubling both the people in her real life and the people in Oz. But crucially, the actors mostly play villains, while her friends are all based on the objects. Some of this makes for great storytelling shorthand. Mombi's many different heads are all different women, none of which we've seen before and which doesn't really give us much to think about. However, after locking her up, Dorothy attempts to escape by finding her original head, and when she does… Dorothy 
as with the original, the reveal of Jean Marsh is when the lines of reality begin to blur, and I think that's the key to unlocking the true thematic intent. How Oz interprets the bleak, awful reality she left behind where the adults are out to make her life miserable, the significance of which becomes more apparent when she finally meets the Gnome King. Dorothy! Scarecrow! Your friend is the thief! In the books, the Gnome King is truly Oz's main villain, the leader of a group of rock fairies called gnomes who live in the mountains, and described by Dorothy as a sort of grey Santa, the actual Santa in fact becoming an Oz character. The film's take is interestingly literal, making the king a part of the mountain itself in a hella rad claymation effect so he doesn't come off like the Volvic volcano. When we meet him, we actually see the Santa vibes are still there, in a different way, very Ghost of Christmas present. But like the books, he takes rather than gives, wanting back the emeralds of Emerald City City that were mined from his mountain and to take revenge on Oz. I was just taking that for those lying. You have so much! But that is not the point. That said, he comes across as pretty reasonable and, as in the book, challenges Dorothy to a game. Her friends, that he turned into ornaments, all exist in his vast collection room, and if she or the others guess which they are correctly, he'll bring them back. But every time they guess incorrectly, that person will turn into an ornament too, and unlike the book, he'll become a little more human. I've seen a lot of people take this very much at face value and criticise it as some kind of plot hole. Why would the Gnome King want to become human? What else is it he wants? Is this a metaphor for taking back land? No, 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 no. That's all too literal. The king's need to take things back is about Dorothy, not Oz. The greatest insult being the most recognizable object he took for himself. My ruby slipper! No, no, no. My ruby slippers. It's another connection to the original film designed to get a reaction. The silver slippers from the book were changed to ruby red, because it looked better on camera, and a hefty fee was paid to MGM to use the rights to their change here, the most overt evidence that Merch wanted the audience to make some connection between the two stories. Just, it's such a powerful, iconic image that in that case, I decided, even in writing the screenplay, I said it, it just has to be they have to be ruby slippers. It helps add to the perverse quality of the whole thing. While he'd look fabulous on the runway, there was always something wrong about these things a little girl would treasure being greedily kept by a smug adult, and not just any adult. As her friends take the challenge, and as they fail, we see the king become more human. We see him go from a stop-motion monster to an actor in different layers of makeup, and the actor beneath it is Nicole Williamson, Dr. Worley, the man who wants to take Oz away from Dorothy. We didn't spend all this time in the asylum by accident. Earlier in the film, the doctor Doctor attempts to relate to Dorothy by likening his awful machine to a person, and not because he's trying to be nice. Now this fella here has a face. Do you see it? The Doctor believes Dorothy is disturbed and wants to take away what he feels are dangerous, silly thoughts, only putting it to her this way not because he believes, but because he thinks it will get her to do what he wants, essentially mocking her. Why, it's his tongue. <laughs> Isn't it? Will it hurt? The Gnome King likewise only speaks nicely because he wants to take from her, to dismantle the friends she believes in back into the objects they came from, and we see the Doctor's intention start to slip into Oz's reality, the motivation's no longer about conquering a country, but proving it doesn't exist. Soon, there'll be no one left who remembers Oz, and I will be completely human. We never see him go all the way human, but judging by the facts, there's only one logical outcome. In his final form, he'll become the Doctor, and Oz will vanish. There's no place like home. The film is, in essence, a passionate argument for the importance of children's fantasy and a child's self-worth. Baum series often deals with the idea of children dealing with adults, and the fact that while children look to them for guidance, they don't always have the right answers or their best interests at heart. This goes all the way back to the wizard, a con artist who ended up in Oz by accident and felt he had to game the system to protect himself, very well represented for the purposes of the Wiz, actually. The Witch of the West was always out to make others her servants, proving her undoing when she does the same to Dorothy. The Scarecrow proves to be a terrible king and is kicked out by General Ginger, who's even worse. She was a light 
parody of a suffragette, but while Baum was no saint, he and his family were supporters of the movement, with Ginger using her power and army of women purely to serve herself, compared to every other leading lady in the series. It led to a Derry resonant scene where it's revealed that her replacement and the true ruler of Oz, Princess Ozma, was and had always been the story's hero, Tip, disguised as a boy by Mombi and the Wizard in order to protect the Emerald City stability. Tip doesn't necessarily want to become a girl again, because she worries all her new friends will forget the person they got to know. But she does change back, and quote, I hope none of you will care less for me than you did before. I'm still the same old Tip you know, only I'm… I'm… Only you're different, said the pumpkin head, and everyone thought it was the wisest speech he had ever made. Fairy tales put kids in charge of reality. It gives them fantastical scenarios to have them think about the decisions they would make beyond what they know, to better make the decisions in their real lives and define who they are. The Oz books are filled with children having to navigate the rules laid down by adults and become self-sufficient, often changing the perspectives of the adults around them, while figuring out their own path through life. It's why the original film has Dorothy investing in these strangers and turning them into a group of friends, and why her saying goodbye is like one of the saddest scenes in cinematic history. The first time we get the impression they're not real enough to stay with, and she knows it. I think I'll miss you most of all. But that journey wasn't worthless. She can take it and make it a part of her real life. The key conflict of return is why that still matters. Dorothy wants to go back, but what is the benefit? Why is Oz important? And the answer is because it gives her things the adults can't. She is badly let down by her well-meaning guardians and made to deal with manipulative, smug deconstructionalists who think that their position means they can get away with truly horrific things. Dorothy proves they can't. The same feeling of that goodbye is present in the scene where the Gnome King gleefully asks for her friends to go and become objects, so he can basically prove they're not real. But the irony is that Dorothy has invested in them, gotten us to invest in them, and we realise through the speeches they give how much more human they are than him on every level, and what that says about Dorothy. Being an ornament will probably be hardest on you, Dorothy, since you're used to eating and sleeping and other such activities. Since I never eat or sleep, I would miss them. It's heartbreaking, but it's so, so nice. The subtext of the film is you must defend your dreams. You can't let the world take away your dreams from you. There, that's your most prized possession. Dorothy succeeds because she has the ability to make Oz real wherever she is, under any given circumstance, to give life to something great while the Doctor slash Gnome King can only take. To create Oz is to prove a generous spirit with the ability to build, and someone who can do that can offer those benefits to anyone, anywhere, an imagination that presents an individuality and strength of character rather than a weakness. Not only does the Doctor's machine that she brought to life help her beat the King's game and restore all her friends as he becomes more and more of a monster, it's her own sense of logic in her own land that wins out. Because, as in the books, what is it that defeats the intelligent, logical, all-powerful adult? Everybody was rescued except Dr. Worley. He ran into rescue his machines. I'll tell you what really sold me on going down this path, because I was having difficulty to begin with identifying all these thoughts I had swirling around my head, what it all meant, and why I felt so, so good after seeing it. Because I was like, gosh, that had way more of an impact than I thought. Look, I I'll tell you what it was. The music. I think people remember Return only for its darkness, and David Shire's huge, symphonic score is definitely part of that, some very frightening sounds and moments in there along with these wonderful sweeps. But what sticks out to me more are the themes he created for all the characters, and specifically, the theme he created for Oz itself. When Dorothy first washes onto its shore, there's this frightening kind of low bowing sound, like the Gnome King's minions are murmuring to each other, curious about this new visitor, in this land they think they have control of. But popping in every now and then, erratically, comedically, jauntily, is a ragtime. Immediately, it's this creeping sense of fun and mischief fighting against those doubters, the irrepressible nature of Oz. For every teenager on here who's tried to tell you this is some kind of grimdark epic, that's the sound that defies it. 
The same way the hero's choice of victory kind of laughs in the face of the Gnome King, or how the characters refuse to be impolite or angry in spite of being placed in impossibly bad circumstances. When that sound first comes in, it's like Dorothy asking if it's still there, her expectation and ours, which of course doesn't get immediately met. But when the movie ends, it comes back with feeling. Now a full orchestral ragtime march, the theme returns with the Emerald City, a turn-of-the-century utopia made to look like this enormously grand comeback, and hitting that much harder because it's been so absent. They manage to make what's only a few minutes of screen time feel like a tremendous victory that becomes the main takeaway of the film's feeling, the march only emphasising this as a celebration of Oz and what it should be. Nothing spells this out more than the fact that almost every extra in this shot is dressed as a specific Oz character. I am deadly serious. There's the Patchwork Girl, the Frogman, Polychrome, General Ginger, Glinda, keeping a bit of a low profile for some reason, the Wobblebug, the, l the, the Lumpy Man, <laughs> there's, there's 40 books, they can't all be bangers. For only a few minutes, the effort was made to restore the entire universe of Oz to the screen, and that is absolutely the point. Return to Oz isn't a deconstructionist nightmare, it's a reconstructionalist triumph. It's about putting the wonder and fantasy and humour back in Oz after a bunch of cynical, well-educated adults took it out, and the end is a grand return to the glory of Oz as we would hope to remember it. Far from a cynical look at the original, or an attempt to correct it or adapt the book as intended, it's a celebration of the idea of Oz on all accounts, what it means to all of those who enjoy it in all its different forms, and why, even if it puts you and Dorothy through so much peril, it only makes the light at the end of the tunnel even brighter. Merch and his crew described the film as Dorothy going back to retrieve a piece of herself she left behind, this feeling that Oz mattered and needing to understand why that was worth fighting for. In the end, she does that, negotiates its return on her own terms, and it feels great. I wish I could be in both places at the same time. Oh, look! Behind you in the mirror! We do finally meet Ozma, revealed to be the other girl from the asylum, and it's implied she kind of acts as that missing piece, the part of her that's needed to remain in Oz and make sure it's well thought of from now on. But she was always there, in some way. Glinda, many years ago, was right. Oz, and everything about it that's so wonderful, was always there, and always will be. This time, hopefully, it will be harder to forget. Put the mirror straight, sweetheart. Like the original, Return didn't do very well in its initial run, but unlike the original, it never recovered. When the critics started running it down, Jeffrey Katzenberg, in a classic Jeffrey move, closed down the advertising and let the film slowly phase out while they focused on their new strategy. Even Merch would probably admit that, while he obviously didn't set out to encroach on the original's legacy and that it shouldn't be judged as such, he also didn't make something that demanded the same kind of widespread adoration. He returned to editing soon after. The rest of the cast and crew scattered and carried on with life, popping up in places you probably wouldn't have expected. Funnily enough, my dad, through a mutual friend absolute years ago, actually met Feruza Balk, and they chatted a little about the experience, with her relating the difficulties she saw through production, and how many kids had frightened at the time, not going quite the way for her budding career that she'd expected. No sour grapes, of course. By all accounts, Feruza, Merch, and so many others involved were fine to have moved on, and very proud to have been a part of it. Finished art of any kind is a minor miracle, and I think, while it would have been nice in the short term for this to be a runaway success, in the long term I think it's been more appropriate to the film's intentions, something that spoke to children in a way other films would not, offering an Oz that would get them asking questions well into adulthood, encouraging them to return to see if it was real, after all. I guess that's my issue with so many Oz projects since, going back to the surface of the original film and extrapolating ideas that go against that feeling. Big, glossy works with very transparently shallow objectives. Or shady, cheapo projects even Martin Short can't save. Return gets a lot closer to what I think Oz embodies best, that secret conversation letting a child know it's all real. I kind of like it being this hidden project that realises the mad world of the books, while including the original film as part of its makeup, which, in spite of my efforts to try and make a case for what I feel the film is truly expressing, absolutely gives kids the choice to take what they want from the experience, to enjoy it regardless of whatever it might be trying to say as this thrilling, totally creative adventure, laughing in the face of logic, or you know, to get a little spook on. I was fully expecting a 
a revisit to be one of these nostalgic letdowns. Like, oh, that's atmospheric and creative, but it isn't really saying anything special. Or it doesn't work. And man, that's so not the case. Much like Dorothy, I was kind of confronting myself and realising it had more of an impact than I'd given credit. How much of what I'd said and done and created over the years was chasing the same feeling, and that seeing it now, and all of its intentions, felt like retrieving a bit of myself I'd forgotten about too. It's the main reason to go back to anything, to keep in touch with where you've been, but also help better understand where you're going. Show the benefits of what brought you here to begin with in a way you'd never considered before. To make the old new again. Or maybe, you know, just… maybe… maybe. It's just good to feel like a kid again. Thanks for watching! A huge shout out once again to my patrons for their support. They've helped fund many of the upcoming projects you'll be seeing in the next couple months, and if you'd like to see your name somewhere here, then I'd really appreciate any support you can offer. Lots of exciting things I want to be able to reveal soon. If you enjoyed this, then you can check out my other videos and also some of the sources used. Some very fun and fascinating looks at this film that I'll have links to in the description. Until then, I guess I'll see you guys over the rainbow. Uh, in Claymation Hell, probably. Well, the name Oz, as a matter of minor interest, was inspired by the letters O to Z on the front of a filing cabinet. Bet you didn't know that.